It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics. When they stand at that podium, they speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. Canada's go-to forum for conversations that matter for the past 120 years. My name is Kelly Jackson, and I am past president of the board of directors of the Empire Club of Canada, and I am your host for today. I have the honor of filling in for Sal Rabani, who is the chair of the club. To formally begin this afternoon, I want to acknowledge that we are gathering today on the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wyandot peoples. In acknowledging traditional territories, I always try to do so from a place of understanding the privilege my ancestors and I have had since they first arrived in this country in the 1830s. As farmers in southwestern Ontario, I often imagine that they felt a very deep connection to the land and yet likely did not recognize how that connection was built on the displacement of others. So delivering a land acknowledgement for me, it's always an important opportunity to reflect on our human connection and responsibility to care for the land and to recognize that to do so, we must always respect each other and acknowledge our histories. And at the club, we encourage everybody to learn more always about the traditional territory on which you work and live. So today, we have the honor of welcoming the Honorable Prabhmeet Sarkaria, Minister of Transportation, the Government of Ontario. Welcome, Minister. Well, that was a great welcome. <laughs> the Empire Club of Canada is a nonprofit organization, and we would like to recognize our sponsors who generously support the club. And they make these events possible, and importantly, they make them complimentary for our online viewers to attend. Thank you to our lead event sponsors, Atkins Realis, Leuna, and the Ontario Road Builders Association. Thank you to our supporting sponsors, Billy Bishop, Toronto City Airport, CAA, Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario, and Woodbine Entertainment. And thank you to our season sponsors, Amazon Web Services, Bruce Power, and Hydro One. Transportation is the backbone of our economy. It helps move people and goods. It supports our communities, our jobs and businesses. It has a direct impact on our well-being and quality of life. 16 million people depend on Ontario's public transit and its roads and highways every day. Billions of dollars are moved every day on our transportation networks. The efficiency and safety of these movements have a direct impact on the province's competitiveness productivity and attractiveness as an investment destination. And at the same time, hundreds of thousands of people from all across Canada and the world come to visit our beautiful province every year. And they use those roads, highways, and public transit to move around and discover all that Ontario has to offer. So I think it's fair to say that Minister Sarkaria has a big job. 
He has been tasked with delivering the government's plan to invest almost $100 billion over the next decade in new roads, highways, public transit, and other critical infrastructure. From projects like the Ontario Line and Highway 413 to First in Canada legislation on driving licenses and vehicle registrations that has been put forward recently, today we get to hear about Minister Sarkaria's vision for a better, faster, safer transportation future in Ontario. And I got to say that close to home from a Humber College perspective, I'm particularly excited about the Finch West Light Rail Transit, which I believe will be opening at the end of 2024, and I will be listening to see if this uh, makes the speech or maybe comes up in the Q&A. <laughs> there is incredible effervescence to our province, or incredible effervescence in our province when it comes to transportation. And today, we're gonna to hear about the progress that's been done and what we should expect for the future. We are facing explosive population growth and as a need for more modern, reliable, sustainable infrastructure. It's there, we know it's there, and we can't wait to hear more about it. So just before we get started with the rest of the program, I do want to take a minute and recognize the Empire Club's board of directors, our staff, and all the members of our incredible community. Thank you for your contributions and for your commitment to advancing public dialogue. And a big thank you to our younger colleagues who are here in the room and in tuning in online. We have students with us and young leaders today, and I know how committed Sal is as chair to increasing the club's reach to better include the next generation of leaders and change makers, and I just want to recognize them and thank them for being here. We are going to be accepting questions from the audience for the speaker by scanning the QR code if you're in the room in your program booklet. And if you are watching online today, you will find a Q&A where you can enter your question uh, right underneath the video player. If you are joining us online today and you require any technical assistance, please start a conversation with our team. You will see there is a chat button on the right hand side of your screen. Please engage, ask questions and share your point of view. I'd now like to invite everybody to turn their attention to the screens to view a video from our lead sponsor, Atkins Realis. With each tick of the clock, tomorrow is being crafted by the doers and the daring, game changers that are engineering what's coming, creating new solutions to humanity's toughest challenges. Together, let's unleash a new energy and make the extraordinary a reality. Together, we are Atkins Realis. It is now my pleasure to invite Joseph Mancinelli, president of Leuna, to introduce our guest speaker. Joseph, welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, pleasure to be here with you uh, and an honor um, to introduce our guest speaker here today. For too long, our province has experienced budget cuts that have affected the infrastructure of our province. In fact, time and time again, we are forced to drive on roads with potholes, in fact, in, in my hometown of Hamilton, they're putting um, uh, speed bumps in the city, and I told them, why, we, why waste your time with the potholes that we have? Uh, nobody can drive fast anyways. Um, and so <laughs> our past governments, unfortunately, uh, abandoned us when it comes to investing in infrastructure, investing in our roads, investing in expanding our uh, transportation system. My 140,000 members in Ontario are the very workers that you swear at on the roads that you bump into, and they are the workers who are anxious and satisfied to finally hear that there is a government here in Ontario that actually cares about the future 
of our road system, of our transportation systems right across this wonderful province. You know, there is so much on the books that's coming uh, for the next few decades that is going to keep an entire generation of workers working and building roads, building subways, building LRTs, uh, building many parts of our transportation system right across the country. These are high paying jobs. These are jobs then that pay well and they take that pay into different communities right across Ontario and it impacts the economics of many cities right across uh, the province. Many of our contractors in the road building industry, for example, some that are here today, um, the impact that they have on the economy as well by building these roads uh, is very impactful uh, as, as well. And so we've seen so many examples of a government that cares about moving folks around the province. We've seen the Ontario line, of course, that's been built, Eglinton West Bypass, the Scarborough line, Bradford Bypass, and of course, 413, the button that I wear here today, that is finally uh, uh, underway. And of course, let me not forget the Hamilton LRT minister, and we need to get that going in my hometown uh, as well. I have had uh, the pleasure of working with Minister Sarkaria um, when he was the Minister of Small Business and uh, red tape, cutting red tape. And he has done a great job in every ministry that he's worked in. At Treasury Board head as well, we had an opportunity to meet on occasions, done an exceptional job there. And we're looking forward um, to Minister Sarkaria moving the transportation portfolio forward, which is a gigantic portfolio, and not only in all of the roads we have to repair and build and new roads that we have to build, but all of the other transportation sectors right across the province. So ladies and gentlemen, we're so pleased to have our minister with us. Please join me in welcoming Minister Sarkaria. very much. Sorry, Joe, I just got to raise this up a little bit here. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for that uh, very kind introduction and to Layuna uh, as well for all the incredible work uh, that you do to support uh, people, uh, workers, uh, construction workers across this province. You've done an incredible job and it's been an absolute pleasure and honour uh, to work with uh, you and your team, so thank you. It's also uh, great to be here. Thank you. It's also great to be here with uh, all of you and see so many people, including key transportation leaders, uh, community leaders here today. But I'm also glad to see that uh, everyone was actually able to make it here, despite that gridlock uh, on the gardener. But don't worry, we have a solution. We're going to build some bike lanes. <laughs> what else? But it kind of sucks sometimes, you know. I'm the one guy in the city that really isn't allowed to complain about the traffic, but that's okay. I, I'd also like to recognize the critical work uh, that is being done in collaboration with industry leaders like Atkins, Realis, and indigenous leaders that are here today. We're very thankful to have uh, all of you here today as well. Uh, Chief McQuabby, uh, Chief Paywis, uh, Chief Mike, and Anthony LaForge uh, for being here today. Uh, the collaboration partnerships are essential uh, for all of us to deliver on our mandate to, to build and work together to build uh, this province of Ontario. And I'd be remiss if I didn't get a chance to uh, give a shout out to the amazing Associate Minister of Transportation. We call him VJ One Fair Thanagaslam. He's delivering for the people of this province. 
My parliamentary assistant, Rick Brzee, uh, and uh, together we are delivering on one of the most robust transportation plans in Ontario's history. And I'm also glad to be joined here today uh, by Mayor Burton. I see that he is here to, uh, today as well. I also recognize my deputy minister and a former colleague of mine, uh, Minister Monty McNaughton, who is also in attendance today. So thank you all for being here. And I'm truly grateful you're all here uh, for the Empire Club and the staff, um, the sponsors, and also my good friend Rod Phillips, who will be moderating as well. You know, I have a great appreciation uh, for the Empire Club. Um, you know, the, one of the go-to forums, of course, for conversation that really matters in our province, in our country. We engage in meaningful uh, dialogue, the thought leadership. Uh, so thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to be here, use your stage, and speak to, to all of you today. A big round of applause for all of you and all that you do. But it should not surprise anybody here today that I, I didn't come here to complain about the traffic. I came here to talk about how we are choosing to fix it. I use the word choosing deliberately because the state of the roads, highways, and transit, just like the state of housing, and so much more, is really a reflection of the choices that our government and previous governments have all made. So today, I wanna to take you on a little bit of a tour of the choices that Premier Ford is making, I am making, and the government is making as we tackle the big economic and social challenges of this time. I wanna talk about the choices we are making to crack down on dangerous drivers and auto thieves. I wanna talk about the choices we are making to get cars moving and people home and to work each and every single day. I wanna talk about the choices we are making to truly transform Ontario's transit network across the GTA. And I wanna talk about the choices we are making to make Ontario the leader, jurisdictional leader in, in, uh, in EVs. So let's start with road safety. We've just introduced a bill recently called the Safer Roads and Communities Act, which will introduce some long overdue measures to make our roads safer. Here's where I stand on impaired driving. If you drive under the influence of drugs or alcohol and take a life, you should never be allowed to drive again. That's what this bill will do. There's no context, nuance, or excuse that can justify taking a life while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. My position is simple. Listen to our friends at MAD. Just don't drink and drive. Don't do drugs and drive. Make your own smart choice. It will save lives. And I want to thank the CEO of MAD who is here today, Steve Sullivan. Your advocacy has been crucial to implementing these smart and strong measures. Likewise, on auto theft. Maybe a quick show of hands here. How many people know someone or has had their own car stolen? Pretty much everybody in this room, exactly. And this is something that is so rampant in my own community of Brampton and across Peel region, across Toronto, the GTA. It's everywhere. It's a cowardly act, often violent, that can traumatize families and the communities that experience it. And we won't hesitate to use every tool in our toolbox to keep them off our streets. That's why, if passed, our bill will ensure that the suspension of driver's licenses of anyone convicted of auto theft in Ontario. And look, I've heard from many people that complain that this measure is just not going to do enough to deter the criminals behind auto theft. And you know what? They're right. But I'm here to say that we are pulling every lever I can to get tough on auto theft. But here are the facts. The provincial government can only take away your license. We only have so many options. This is a criminal matter, and criminal matters are federal responsibilities. And I think, to date, the Trudeau government's response to car theft crisis has been pathetic. The families living in fear of car thieves don't need another auto theft panel, summit, or working group. We need real action with criminal sanctions that will put car thieves and leaders of these criminal gangs behind bars and keep them there. Because, yeah. 
Because even if the primary responsibility is federal, our government is choosing to use every tool in our toolbox to keep everyone in Ontario safe. We are also taking a similar approach to the challenges of our growing population. We're pulling out all the stops. Now consider this, by 2051, the Greater Golden Horseshoe will have a population of almost 15 million people. Gridlock already costs our economy $11 billion a year, and that number is only growing. And our province welcomes more than 500,000 newcomers each year. These are the numbers. These are the facts. And we know these challenges will not magically go away on their own. And once again, we must make a clear choice. The first choice, well, is to do nothing. To sit back, cross our fingers, that the problem will solve itself, to say no to important new projects, and to work with anti-development activists to block anything from being built. And I know it's shocking, but this is probably a choice that many people would prefer, or some people would prefer. There are probably three other parties in the Ontario legislature today who think that they can respond to our growing population challenges with a combination of saying no and doing nothing. And here's the thing, oddly enough, there's a lot of ways to do nothing. And that's probably because doing nothing is the easiest thing to do. But I sit here and look at the data that shows that highways in the GTA will be over capacity by 2031. And living that painful experience that many of you share of being stranded in gridlock as we try to move between home and work. And I can tell you that doing nothing is not an option, not for Premier Ford, and not for our government. Now there's one other choice we could make, and that seems to be the one of preferred by the Prime Minister, and that choice would be making, taking cars off the road by making driving unaffordable altogether. This, of course, is the entire ploy of the carbon tax. It is also, by the way, the kind of carbon tax that Ontario Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie first crusaded back in 2008, before Justin Trudeau even knew what a carbon tax was. There is no magic or mystery to how that tax works. On the other hand, our government is focused on making life more affordable, and we will not stand for unnecessary taxes that make the basic needs, like driving or heating your home, even harder in today's economy. The federal carbon tax is a terrible policy, attempting to solve one problem by creating an even bigger one. Our position is crystal clear. A carbon tax will never be acceptable to our government. But that means if doing nothing and making it unaffordable to drive are not options, what's left? Well, it's quite simple. We are choosing to build. Building is Premier Ford's choice, my choice, and our entire government's choice. Building the infrastructure that transforms homes into communities, energy, wastewater, education and health infrastructure, and yes, the roads, bridges, transit, and highways that the people of Ontario need. Our government is in the business of building all of these things because Canada's housing crisis will not be so solved by home builders alone. So when it comes to our government's plan to build, we are also talking about a plan to move. Now let's talk about that plan to move. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, over the next 10 years, we are investing nearly $100 billion to build the roads, bridges, highways, public transit that will fuel our economy for generations to come. It starts with Highway 413, a critical project that will connect the regions of York, Peel, Halton, running from the 401 and uh, 407 all the way to the west in the forest, all the way to the east in Highway 400. It will save drivers 30 minutes per trip during rush hour. That's five hours every single week that you can spend at home, that I will be spending at home with my wife and two daughters. And hopefully someday 
making, uh, maybe getting to watch a Raptors playoff a game again. Well, I can't guarantee, obviously, that the Raptors will turn it around. I can guarantee the 413 will be built, and in fact, field work is already underway. We have a responsibility to ensure Ontario's drivers have more time to spend on the moments that really matter in life, not stuck in gridlock. That's why just last month, our government announced that we will have shovels in the ground on the 413 by 2025. The 413, <laughs> the 413 represents a massive win for the province. It will create almost 3,000 new jobs and contribute over $400 million to Ontario's real GDP each year. We're creating jobs, we're making real progress, and we're working hard to fight gridlock and get drivers across York, Halton, Peel, and save hours of their time every week. Now, who could be against this? Well, I'm pretty sure I can think of a couple of people. The Ontario Liberals have openly campaigned against Highway 413. And their federal friends in the Trudeau government, with the federal environment minister, Guy Beau, saying their government is going to stop funding roads altogether. What a toxic, ideological position to take. If Stephen Guibault or Bonnie Crombie took the time to step out of their bubble, talk to that mom stuck in gridlock, or to the truckers who drive on our roads each and every single day, they will tell you, we need to build Highway 413. It's just another example of the choices that different leaders and different governments can make. The Liberals' choice is to hurt people with higher taxes and hope it takes cars off the road. We instead choose to help people by building new roads and highways. Highway 413 is just one of the projects we're planning to build. We're also building the Bradford Bypass, a four-lane highway that will save drivers in York Region, Simcoe County, up to 35 minutes per trip. The 16-kilometer highway will connect Highway 404 in the east to Highway 400 in the west. And just like 413, the construction of the Bradford Bypass will generate significant economic benefits and create approximately 2,600 jobs and contribute over $270 million to Ontario's real GDP each year. And once this highway is complete, it will deliver the much needed relief to one of the most congested highway corridors in North America. We're also expanding Highway 3 in Windsor, building a new interchanges across this province, including Highway 416 and Barnsdale Road in Ottawa, widening Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph, and investing in dozens of other projects across the province. But that's not all we're doing to transform Ontario's transportation network. We are taking a balanced approach, building the roads and highways and investing in critical transit infrastructure to give people more options to get where they need to go when they need to be there. With over $70 billion in public transit projects over the next decade, we are building the largest transit expansion in North America. Thank you. This will include historic investments to deliver priority subway projects like the Ontario Line, the Scarborough Subway Extension, and the Young North Subway Extension. That once complete, will double our transit network. It will also include expanded GO tra Transit service as we continue our mission to deliver two-way, all-day service on the busiest GO Rail routes. Just last month, we announced the largest GO train expansion in more than a decade. That will add more than 300 weekly trips on our province's busiest routes. If we look right here in the city of Toronto, shovels are already in the ground to build the Ontario line. This will be a complete game changer for the people of this province and the city who are frustrated with the overcrowding and limited options. Consider this. The Ontario Line will accommodate 40 trains per hour and almost 40,000 riders per day. 
offering multiple connections to existing subway stations, streetcars, and bus routes. Wait times for the next train will be as short as 90 seconds. This new line will reduce crowding at the TTC's busiest stations by as much as 15% and put thousands of Toronto residents within walking distance of public transit. But our transit solutions do not stop at the borders of Toronto. The Young North subway extension will revolutionize public transit in the GTA by extending the TTC's Line 1 subway all the way into Richmond Hill. The extension will put 26,000 people within walking distance of public transit and accommodate more than 94,000 daily trips. Commuters will save as much as 40 minutes per day that's hours more each week to spend with friends and families and reduce gridlock by taking cars off the road. And we aren't stopping there. The Scarborough subway extension will add three stops and almost eight kilometers of new track to the TTC's Line 2 subway, creating high-speed service for commuters east of the downtown core. Riders will benefit from connections to GO Transit and Durham Region Transit, making travel across the GTA more seamless than ever before. And we're also investing in light rail transit projects that will play a key part in our plan to expand transportation networks across the GTA. That is why we recently issued a request for proposals to design and build seven stations that will make up the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, which will extend the Crosstown nine kilometers west into Mississauga and put 37,000 additional commuters within walking distance of public transit. We've also declared the Hazel McCallion line extensions in downtown Brampton and downtown Mississauga as priority projects so we can accelerate construction and get shovels in the ground faster. We're going to do all of this while making transit even more affordable and easier than ever before, including by launching credit card and debit payments on Go Transit, the Up Express, and the TTC, and by introducing Presto on Google Wallet. And it doesn't end there. Thanks to Minister Thanagaslam, all Apple users in the crowd will be happy to know that we are introducing even more ways to pay, including your Apple Wallet. Transit has never been more convenient. And with these critical investments, we will double our current transit network to provide commuters with even more choices for their travel, including what they use to get there. We all know that electric vehicles are expected to play a massive role in our clean energy and transportation future, which is why our government continues to choose to invest in the jobs of the future. Our province has established itself as a world leader in the EV space, securing more than $40 billion in investments to build electric vehicles and EV batteries. Look no further than Honda's recent $15 billion investment, which will create more than 1,000 jobs to build Canada's first comprehensive electric vehicle supply chain right here in Ontario. We know that Ontarios live all over, whether it be rural, urban communities, in the north, in the south, east, and the west. And we need charging infrastructure to serve all of those communities. These are the investments we need to build our province for the future, and our government has always been the first to make it our priority. Now, if you remember one thing that I said today, it's that we cannot overlook the importance of making choices. We are choosing to take a stand on auto theft and impaired driving. We are choosing to stare down our opponents who want to build nothing at all, and instead, we're standing tall to say that we will build the roads and highways and transit infrastructure that Ontario desperately needs. And we are choosing to make smart investments to ensure Ontario remains a global leader in the EV industry. None of these policies, none of these investments and none of this progress is or was automatic. Different governments make different choices. 
In fact, the choices of the previous government is what got Ontario into so much trouble in the first place. I'm completely okay with facing criticism or questions about the choices that our government is making. But what I am not okay with is doing nothing. The world is not waiting for Ontario. The choices we make today matter. Our government will always choose to build. We will always choose to act, and we will always choose to get it done. Thank you very much. See, I told you he had a big job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister Sarkaria. I'd now like to invite Rod Phillips, Vice Chair at Canaccord Genuity Corp and former Ontario Minister of Finance to facilitate a discussion with the Minister. Short cut there. Well done, Minister. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to uh, work wouldn't uh, get a chance to be on the Empire Club stage. A lot more fun to be the moderator, not the speaker. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I think you can all see um, how my, my former colleague here is seen to be one of the rising stars in Canadian politics. And so um, in that spirit, Minister, I hope you don't mind if I ask a couple of questions, Absolutely. and I hope you don't mind if a couple of them are a little bit uh, challenging. I, uh, and of course, you are submitting questions as well, so please, uh, please put those forward, and they will, I am told, magically appear on this iPad. But Minister, to get, to get started, um, you mentioned the Eglinton Crosstown. Um, I had, couldn't help, I was chatting to the, uh, the students from Humber a bit earlier, and I was, they're you know, bright young people, no doubt going to be in the region for a long time, and I had to wonder if they're going to get to see the opening. Uh, so, uh, so can you give us a little bit of a sense about, about that project, maybe a, maybe a bit for what we've learned, but yeah. about as well about, uh, about where, we think, where we think that's going. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great question. It's probably one of the most uh, frustrating projects for not only myself as the Minister of Transportation, but for many who have uh, faced this file, but also for the public, most importantly. I think every single one of us has been impacted by that uh, gridlock or that traffic and the time it takes to, to move in, in Toronto that has been caused by, the, um, by this uh, construction. But what I can say to you today is that construction is complete on the Crosstown. It is simply right now a matter of testing and commissioning. And this is something that is really important. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not going to make excuses for, for what's happened to date, um, but I can tell you one of the biggest things a government can do is look at what was done in the past and ensure that we don't repeat those same mistakes again. And so I think we've learned very well from the challenges that, the, uh, that that project caused us in delivering transit, building transit, and everything that you have seen launched by the Premier under our mandate, ambitious mandate to, to build infrastructure, especially public transit, reflects the learnings of that. So we've got shovels in the ground in almost every single one of the projects that we have announced at a record speed. We have changed the way we, as a government, uh, uh, procure uh, a lot of these projects and build more flexibility, bring individuals into, uh, and, and, and those who can build these projects into the picture a lot earlier, a more collaborative approach, uh, approach the most part. Uh, and now we're seeing that progress, whether it be the Scarborough subway extension, the Ontario line, these projects are well, well underway. Uh, but um, uh, we're going to work as hard as we can to ensure that the Crosstown uh, gets open. Uh, but the one thing that I want to make sure is that we don't now, in the testing and commissioning phase, uh, rush anything that could jeopardize any individual's uh, safety once it's operational. So we've made a lot of progress, a lot more work to do, and we're going to continue doing so as the construction is completed and we're now into uh, testing and commissioning. Great. Well, here's the first question from, uh, from the audience. Now, um, you joked about the issues on the Gardner, but you know, all of us had to come here today uh, to one of the most, I mean, literally one of the most congested cities in uh, North America. Um, so, you know, 
who are you working with? I know this isn't just your responsibility, but how are you, uh, how are you addressing fixing that congestion problem in the shorter term? It's a great question. It's probably the, the biggest question I get everywhere I go. Uh, as I said, I can't make any, I can't complain about traffic ever just because it really falls on us. But I think what one of the approaches that we have taken is, has been a very collaborative approach. I think right off the bat, the first thing is we have to get these projects built. We have to get these shovels in the ground. So where we see a lot of this disruption, it's for the better. It's because we need to invest in public transit. Right around, right here at Queen Street, we're seeing the Ontario line being built. We're seeing projects um, moving forward. The city is obviously uh, under very heavy pressure with all this uh, construction. But this is because we had governments in the past that refused to invest in some of these most, uh, some of the most important modes of transportation. You know, this will help our economy. It will help people move faster. And if we don't do it now, it will never happen. And so we're going to have to struggle. But that being said. As this transit expansion is happening, you know, I had a chance to just chat with Mayor Olivia Chow as we were talking about a lot of the challenges uh, just today on the Gardner and the congestion. Uh, we're piloting projects, for example, with the City of Toronto on even traffic lights, the AI, the 5G networks that we're putting there, some of the cameras that we're putting there with regard to uh, congestion, how we can move uh, traffic faster. Uh, we've got a working group uh, through the ministry with the City of Toronto to see how can we speed up the process of building that gardener quicker, more efficiently, so we aren't seeing the impacts that we are today. Uh, so I think it takes collaboration between different levels of government. And I have to say that Mayor Olivia Chow has been a great partner to work with uh, since uh, she's been elected. We have all been uh, working for the betterment uh, of this uh, city. And although we may and will disagree on many ideological uh, you know, uh, concepts and uh, ideas, on the transit file, we are moving forward and working together to see how we can benefit the people of this province and move uh, more efficiently and, and quickly. So um, it's about uh, bringing everybody together to see how can we think outside the box? How can we move people quicker, knowing that we are going to have uh, these constraints? Uh, so, but I assure everybody there won't be any bike lines uh, on the Gardner or Don Valley Express. Right. But I promise that. <laughs> See Joseph Mancinelli leading the con leading the applause on uh, on that. Uh, so now we've heard about projects, and and we, I think in this room, but I think Ontarians, I mean they've they've said it at the ballot box, they appreciate the need to build and grow, but there are other considerations about, uh, about whether it be the environment or how communities evolve. How do you balance in your role, $100 billion, a lot of money to spend, a lot of our money, so keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you balance those other considerations? Because there are legitimate balances that have to be made and decisions in government that aren't easy. No, I think that's uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I have now been in this file for about six to eight months. I would say um, almost every project that we have put forward, um, uh, there in some circumstances can be very, uh, I would say, constructive criticism of that project. But one of the things that I have, I have really seen is sometimes a very targeted, organized approach to, to stop certain projects. And, and, you know, I mentioned that in my speech about very much anti-development. There are some people that just don't want to see change. They don't want to see highways being built. They don't want to see uh, the benefits, whether it be public transit, uh, whether it be highways. It's very consistent. And I look at uh, basically the um, past uh, challenges that we've had with the Ontario line. We had about, you know, we have some of the most robust uh, plans uh, when it comes to the environment. Uh, you can compare them against any province, uh, any state in the US, Canada, we have the strongest environmental protections. And we had this issue about three trees that held up the Ontario line for almost six months where we're planting thousands of trees to replace it. So I think, you know, it's about making sure that, sure, we're going to listen to communities, we engage with them in, in various settings, uh, we ensure that uh, all that is being taken into consideration. But the vast majority of the projects that we have started, I have only heard resounding support for that. So where there is a need to balance some of the issues that uh, might come, come around or come about, we work to mitigate those. But ultimately, somebody has to make a decision. And our decision is always to move forward and build, especially when we see the opportunity to do so. Highway 413 is a great example of that. One of the fastest growing areas in the entire country. We've got highways all across the province. And I can tell you, most of the emails I get about Highway 413 are from people in downtown 
uh, Toronto. It's not the people that actually live in those cities and commute in those cities. Those are the people that need the relief. Those are the people that we need to build for. And that's what the entire vision of building Ontario is about. It doesn't matter if it's just downtown Toronto. It's about building in the north. It's about building in Peel region. It's about building uh, in Windsor and Ottawa. And it's a, a connected transit system, a connected infrastructure system that will really support this province. Well, you, you mentioned 413, and that's, um, I think you, you're reading the mind of the audience here. What do you see, and I, and I know that's out in your neighborhood, what, what do you see as the challenges facing the communities around 413 in terms of how they can benefit from this vital piece of infrastructure that they now know is coming, but, but now what does that mean for them and, and how do they take advantage of it? Yeah, I think there's uh, <clears throat> any time we can build highways um, in a way, and especially in areas where um, uh, we see significant population growth, um, I think ultimately we can look at it from an economic perspective. I think, you know, highways, when we talk about companies that are coming to Ontario, coming to Canada, one of the things that they tell us all the time is the investments that you are making, whether it be in public transit or highways, is one of the things that is really driving their decision to move their operations here, to move their country, I mean, their company here. Um, I think when we develop highways, you have more opportunity for housing, you have more opportunity for better paying jobs, good paying jobs to come with it, not only through the construction side of it, which is a huge benefit for almost you know, 10 plus years, but to what that helps attract in the future. Uh, you know, you look south of the border, you hear all the time about how uh, incredible their highway networks and infrastructure is. We need to really mimic that here, and given that we do almost uh, $400 billion of two-way trade with just the United States and Ontario uh, every single year, we need to continue developing and helping support that infrastructure. We're losing billions of dollars every year stuck in that gridlock, uh, causing uh, a lack of productivity uh, in our economy. Uh, so all of this can really be used. but. The one thing that I always find uh, people appreciate the most is the time you will save to do things that you can appreciate, which is with your family. Like nobody wants to be stuck behind the wheel for an hour every single day. My drive on the, to getting into the city now is almost 30 minutes longer, 30 to 40 minutes longer depending on the day because of the construction on the gardener. Nobody likes to sit in gridlock. Nobody likes to sit uh, idle behind the wheel. So it's important that we make the investments today as our population has grown exponentially and will continue to grow. Uh, we need these investments to build and to support our communities. So I can tell the, uh, the new CEO of the Road Builders is in the room because we're getting more specific now. Uh, so Highway 400, which everybody knows where that is, leads right up into cottage country, was identified in the budget for expansion. And is it possible today to talk about how that timing might connect to what's happening with 413 and the other elements of, uh, of the road infrastructure? Absolutely. I think, you know, you've got some key corridors here, the, the 401, and the 413 will help connect that into the 400, um, and then you've got Highway 400, which you know has seen around that area, whether it be Barrie, Innisfil, uh, and beyond, has seen significant uh, growth as well. Uh, and so, what we need to show and what we need to do is make sure that uh, you know where we're building uh, these relief points in the GTA, that we continue to expand those all across up to the north. Uh, you can drive up uh, right now, uh, up Highway uh, 400, and uh, obviously on a Thursday or Friday when you're trying to get up to your cottage, you can, you know, everyone's kind of experienced how, how difficult uh, that drive can be or congested it can be. Uh, so this plan is really all about making sure that each part of this province, each corner of this province is connected and can move efficiently and effectively. And so where we are building more ways for people to travel to and from the east and the west end, we have to make sure that places, whether it be Barrie uh, and beyond, or um, uh, Barrie Innisfil, uh, places such as though, also have the appropriate uh, investments to ensure that we can, and those people can, can face that relief. So uh, the Bradford Bypass, for example, is gonna save almost 40 minutes uh, for the people in that region. It's much needed relief. It's been, um, uh, governments have talked about it for years and years. Uh, we just issued the design detail of it. We, need, we know we need to do more on that. We need to move faster on it, and that's exactly what we intend to do. Um, but ultimately, we're really excited. It's a plan to build that carries uh, each corner of this province, and we're, we're really looking forward to uh, making sure that happens. 
So what's the most fun thing about being transportation minister? <laughs> I would think it'd be like all the big trucks and stuff you'd get to like sit behind and things. It's actually driving uh, the subway cars. <laughs> no, I promise you I don't do that. But uh, honestly, it's, it, every part of your life is so connected to transit or transportation in some way, whether if you just stay at home and you, you've got to order Uber Eats and get somebody to deliver it. You know, every person in this province relies on our transportation networks. And I think that's a very powerful, um, something that's really powerful. Um, uh, our economy uh, relies on our transportation network. Supply chains would fall apart if we didn't have uh, a good uh, infrastructure uh, and capital uh, to support it. Um, and that's why I'm so proud to work with Premier Ford to help develop and build for the next generation. Look, none of these projects are two-year projects, three-year projects. I think one of the biggest issues with sometimes with governments is you get so focused on the four-year windows of elections. The Ontario Line, uh, the Scarborough West, the Sub Scarborough Subway Extension, the 413, the Bradford Bypass, these are all four plus, five plus year projects that our government is delivering on. It's about not having a short term vision, but a vision that transcends just that, you know, that political four year window. It's about building for the next generation. It's about building for the next uh, de decade. And that's why I'm so proud to, to kind of work with Premier Ford on delivering this mandate and changing the face of how people move uh, in this province. That's probably one of the, the funnest parts of the job is, is just seeing everything being built and seeing the impact that it's going to have uh, on our communities across this province. Great. So we just have time for one more question, and, uh, and it's perfect from the audience. It's so we have some you know, younger people here today. Uh, you have a young family. Um, your job is about thinking about the future. Uh, I mean, imagine, I guess, explaining uh, what you're trying to do on a given day to, to one of your young kids or, or, or one of the students here. You know, what, what is it that, you know, because it's not an easy job, I know that. And, um, and there's a lot of challenges and even well-meaning people will cause challenges. And then, as you said, there's some folks who don't have another solution. They just don't like what you're doing because you're doing something. But how do, you, uh, how do you speak or speak now maybe to that younger generation about, about what this province is going to look like and what it means to get this transportation network built? It really comes down to the quality of life, uh, I think. You know, when you can have uh, a, a transit system that can get you from point A to point B uh, efficiently, if you can, you know, you look at many people have been to Europe, you see how quick and easy it is to just jump on to pretty, any mode of, uh, pretty much any mode of transportation. Um, and get to wherever you want. Uh, it's really, really comes down to that quality of life and that ability to have more opportunities in this province. You know, more jobs will come to Ontario if we have better transit connecting uh, each part of this province. You'll be able to live pretty much anywhere you want within uh, two to three hours of the GTA. We'll get you, whether it be through GO Train or TTC, you can get to, to wherever you need to, to go or regional uh, bus system across this province. Um, it's really about having choices. It's about if you want to drive on a car or you want to take public transit, you have that choice. You can do that. Uh, you know, if you want your business to be able to to succeed and have access to to markets across the world, you know, we're going to give you that that choice and option. So it's really about framing it from an economic perspective and an opportunities uh, perspective for us. These the young people in the room here today uh, will appreciate in 10 years what what this. Um, you know, investment into infrastructure that isn't happening anywhere else in North America. The vision that the Premier and our government has brought to, to making this uh, a generational shift in how we move in this province, I think, will truly be appreciated uh, by that same generation. And we'll look back and see, uh, you know, the courage of the Premier and this government to, to just get it done, get it built, and what that means uh, for, for all of us. So I'm really proud to be a part of that uh, plan and, and someone who's uh, really excited to see that when my kids are able to ride the Ontario line or the Scarborough subway extension or, or ride the hi Highway 413, I think it's going to be really exciting and something that uh, uh, we're all going to be uh, very thankful for in the future. So that's all the time we have, but Minister, thank you very much. Thanks for your service and the service of your colleagues. And, uh, and again, thanks to the Empire Club for providing the forum. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rod and Minister Sarkaria. 
I'd now like to welcome Andrew Welts, board chair for the Ontario Road Builders Association to deliver appreciation remarks. Thank you for your warm introduction, Kelly. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Orba has a, hit, a rich history in the province of Ontario. Founded in 1927, we have been representing the transportation infrastructure industry for 97 years. Today, Orba represents <clears throat> over 280 member companies who build, rehabilitate, and maintain Ontario's roads and transit networks. From small family businesses to large multinationals, Orba members <clears throat> and over 56,000 workers they employ form the backbone of Ontario's construction industry. But Orba is more than an association. It's about building connections, fostering collaboration, and driving economic growth. Orba tirelessly advocates for its members, ensuring their voices are heard in policy discussions, promoting fair procurement practices, infrastructure investments, workforce development, sustainability, and safety standards. It also catalyzes innovation and excellence through industry events and knowledge exchange, helping members stay ahead of the curve and delivering lasting projects. It is my sincere honor to stand in front of you today to thank our keynote speaker, and I must say, one of the greatest transportation ministers I've had the pleasure of working with. Under the leadership of, Minister Ford, of Premier Ford and Minister Sarkaria, Ontario is investing over $27 billion over the next 10 years in the government's highway expansion rehabilitation plan, which includes Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass. Orba members will be ready to deliver these historic projects and promote economic competitiveness, improve transportation efficiency, reduce travel time, and enhance connectivity between regions, ultimately ensuring working people spend less time on the road and more time with their loved ones. The projects our members build serve as a vital lifeline, connecting communities, driving progress, and shaping Ontario's future. As we face future challenges and opportunities, we stand together to build a better, safer, and more prosperous Ontario. Thank you once again, Minister, our vision, for your visionary leadership and commitment to building and revitalizing Ontario's transportation infrastructure. Under your stewardship, we've seen transformative projects and innovative policies involving safety, efficiency, and accessibility. Thank you, and once again, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Empire Club of Canada for hosting this wonderful luncheon. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks again to all of our sponsors for their support and to everybody joining us today in person and online. As a club of record, all Empire Club of Canada events are available to watch and listen to on demand on our website. The recording of this event will be available shortly and everyone registered will receive an email with the link. On Wednesday, June 12th, please join us for the Great Energy Transition event. This is going to feature a curated panel of energy insiders as they discuss how we build out our new, reliable and greener energy supply against unprecedented headwinds. The following day on Thursday, June 13th, I invite you as well to consider joining us. We will have, be hosting the Ontario Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, the Honourable Vic Fideli. The Minister will be sharing insights into how the province has been supporting the revival of Ontario's auto manufacturing sector and creating a climate for job creation in the province. Thank you for your participation and support. I wish everybody a great afternoon. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.